How's it going? Oh, it's gone. All right, you've had a hard week, <laughs> but thank you for the news. Um, talk a little bit about what's been going on this week and how you look at stuff. You and I, I saw you this morning, you were, you were talking about the macroeconomic uh, environment. Talk a little bit about what's happened and how you look at it. Oh, goodness. Um, well, there certainly uh, have been a lot of changes very quickly in the macroeconomic environment. When we entered the year at the beginning of the year, you know, prior to the invasion of Ukraine, we were growing revenue about 44% mm -hmm. year over year. And, you know, we were really excited about how the year was going to unfold. And then, of course, you know, we had this terrible invasion of, of Ukraine. We actually had, you know, quite a sizable team there, mm -hmm. um, which was really challenging to, to work through. And then, of course, after that, you know, rippling through the economy has been, you know, shocks to energy prices, of course, food, et cetera. And, and inflation has run a lot higher and hotter than people expected. And so, uh, you know, of course, in response to that, the, the Fed and, um, you know, the, the ECB are responding with, with rate increases. And that's really changed the, the cost of capital, which has, you know, required businesses to focus a lot more on generating cash. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to generate cash, you have to uh, obviously either grow your revenue a lot faster or reduce your cost structure. And because revenue is growing slower, actually, for a lot of uh, businesses, um, they have to reduce their cost structure. And, and when, when they do that, one of the easiest and fastest ways to do that is actually to turn off digital advertising. That's one mm -hmm. of the benefits of digital advertising. It's so flexible, you can turn it on and off. Um, and, and so we saw that, that impact in our business, and you know, that, that means that now, you know, uh, quarter to date, we've, we've grown about 8% year over year, down from 44%. Uh, and, and looking forward at the macro economy, we don't see a lot of things that make us uh, optimistic. And mm -hmm. so, what we've had to do is, is really restructure our business, focus on our three strategic priorities of mm -hmm. continuing to grow our community, which grew 18% to almost 350 million daily active users in the last uh, quarter, reaccelerate our, our revenue growth, of course, and then really invest in this long-term future mm -hmm. of augmented reality. So, so as part of that, uh, you know, we had to lay off about 20% mm -hmm. of our team, which is, is obviously uh, really difficult, shut down a lot of projects. That right, I brought on. one out, the Pixie, right here, this one here. This was one of the things. I'm not going to bust your chops about it. It's a very lovely looking drone. It's really well done, as most things you make are. Um, so this was one of them that wasn't, it was beautiful, cool, not making money. It's a wonderful low margin product. Okay, all right, which sounds great for a <laughs> business that's struggling. Um, so you, so, so where do you see the company going forward then? What do you, you've done this cut, which, you, which is difficult for anyone. Again, you were going like gangbusters, now you've had to, to pull in. And they, I, I remember Brian Chesky talking about having to do it during the pandemic. You guys did really well during the pandemic. Um, what, do, what do you see the company going forward? Well, our community engagement is really strong. So, you know, in, in the immediate term, we're really focused on reaccelerating revenue growth. And, and the way that we think we can do that is really with, you know, a focus on low funnel direct response advertising. Mm -hmm. So advertising that's really easy to measure, that helps people clearly drive business results, because those are the dollars that even in uncertain macroeconomic times, businesses will still spend because they're very important for generating incremental mm -hmm. revenue. And so what we've done is actually reorganized our team. We promoted Jerry Hunter, a longtime leader at Snap, to chief operating officer. Mm -hmm. He's taking responsibility for really bringing together our product sales and engineering teams mm -hmm. to help us do a much uh, better job of, of solving you know, the technical and operational challenges of running a large scale direct response But you're business. keeping augmented. It was, it was that business. The other business, what was the second one? I'm sorry. We're definitely, uh, oh, our, our priorities, you mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, our community growth, revenue growth, and then investing in, in augmented reality. So talk about augmented. Why keep that? You love them, spectacles, don't you? <laughs> well, spectacles is a, a part of the long-term future of augmented reality. But what's really cool about augmented reality is that over 250 million people are engaging with AR today, on, every day, yeah. on Snapchat through our AR. camera. And, and even more than that, many people are now using our augmented reality tools in other people's applications. Because mm -hmm. businesses embed something called Camera Kit, which is a suite of our AR tools into their own applications to drive mm -hmm. business results. And so what we've been doing over time is slowly building this augmented reality platform on mobile that over time, of course, will transition to things mm -hmm. like wearables. But that's kind of the, the long distant future. But you think it's critically important to continue to, because I've looked at lots of very cool things that you're making. 
around. AR is an enormous driver of our business today, of engagement mm -hmm. today, of course, mm -hmm. revenue, and will continue to be uh, in the future because it's really at the core of what computing is going to look like over the mm -hmm. long term. Mm -hmm. Scott? So, Evan, I don't know if you've been following the conference, but there's been two major themes so far. The first is tick, and the second is talk. <laughs> um, and we, we had and a also, people running for president, but go ahead. By the way, I think this is the only dude who's not running for president who's been yeah. on this stage. Yeah. Yeah, they're all just interested in tech. Right. Anyway, a um, little cynical, a little cynical. Uh, we had a nice conversation. I have 12 and 15-year-old boys. Their primary platforms are Snap and TikTok. And uh, the more I've gotten to know them, the more I like Snap. It strikes me as joyous and communication, and the less or the more I'm worried about TikTok. Uh, the business world or consumers are not listening to me. It feels like everyone but TikTok, their business is declining dramatically. Um, and it just feels like they are kicking the shit out of everybody. So my question is, how do you plan to compete with TikTok and two, and just as a follow-up, do you think TikTok should be banned? <laughs> Good, we're starting with the easy questions. Um, so so in, ter in terms of our strategy, I, I think one of the things that we've learned over time is that by focusing on visual messaging between yep. friends and family, we're able to drive long-term retention and engagement. So when people start using Snapchat you know, to send photos yep. and videos to their friends, they love it and they keep coming back because it's a, a much better way to communicate than text message, right? It's, My yeah. sons are still using it. That's all they use. And, and over yeah. time, we built a business around that messaging by, you know, of, of course, building out stories and Spotlight, which is our yep. TikTok competitor, our map, you know, and the augmented reality platform. So we're gonna we're gonna stick to that strategy of really helping, uh, you know, friends and, and family communicate with visual messaging because we've seen how effective that's been through through lots of ups and downs and tons of competition yes. and a botched redesign. Yes. Uh, you know that that um, that uh, for us has really been core to, to our success. So I think mm -hmm. we'll compete by continuing to to focus on the reason why our community you know, gets value from Snap and, and yeah. just drive towards that north star of over time delivering more and more value uh, to the people who use uh, our service. I think, you know, on, on your second question, that's probably uh, best, uh, best determined by CFIUS. I mean, TikTok is going through a CFIUS review process yep. right now to determine whether or not it should stay in, in our country. Um, I think a, a couple things probably inform that from my perspective. One is that we've, you know, had laws for a really long time about, you know, foreign ownership of, you know, radio or television mm -hmm. or whatever. You have to get approval to do that. So that, that sort of, I think, is, is the context um, here. Uh, you know, and then, and then secondarily, over the last couple of years, obviously, there have been a lot of other products that have been created that are very similar to TikTok, like Shorts and Reels um, mm -hmm. and, and Spotlight. And so I think a lot of the concerns maybe that the administration had in the past of like, you know, oh my gosh, if TikTok goes away, what are people going to do? Where are they going to watch short videos? I think that's sort of been, been answered by um, the, the competitive uh, in, environment. So I, I don't know how you know these trade-offs are being made. The, the interesting thing about the CFIUS process is that it involves so many different stakeholders. You know, mm -hmm. the Treasury and then of course the national security folks. So I don't quite know how that process works, but we'll just kind of have to see what happens. So let's look at just the product itself. Why do you think it's been doing so well and cleaning clocks all over the place? Because you had versions of that. Everybody's had versions of what they managed to do. When you look at a competitor, and often people have copied you. Yeah, pretend you're Facebook. What would you rip off from TikTok? Well, I, what? <laughs> let's, let's role play. Let's do to TikTok what Facebook has been doing to you. Your turn. <laughs> So, so I, I actually, I think the reason why this has been so challenging for companies to respond to in the United States, but also uh, around the world, is the scale of TikTok's investment. So I think what's so interesting, huh. you know, as you look at their business strategy over time, they started by buying a very, very small application that was so small right. that at the time, you know, they bypassed CFIUS review. And then they spend billions upon billions of dollars acquiring users, right, and buying content to subsidize both sides of that marketplace. And of course, you know, uh, with, with artificial intelligence, the more inputs you have, the more people you have watching more content, the, the better it gets and the more personalized it is uh, for the people that use it. And I think what nobody had anticipated in the United States was the level of investment that ByteDance made hmm. into the US market and, of course, uh, in Europe, because it was just something that was unimaginable. I mean, no startup could afford to invest 
invest billions and billions and billions of dollars mm -hmm. in user acquisition like that uh, around the world. So it was a totally different strategy than any technology company had expected before because it wasn't an innovation-led strategy. It was really about you know, subsidizing the large-scale user acquisition around the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now people like it, though. They like to use it. What is the, what is the reason from your, when you use it and look at it yourself? I think the reason is that it gets to know you over time because you invest a lot of time in it. And, and that investment means that the content is more personalized. And so right. I think what, what people find, uh, of course, if they uninstall the app and come back and they you know, haven't created an account or something like that, is that it doesn't reflect their interest anymore and they have to train it again. And that's kind of e exhausting. And so TikTok got this great lead early on, uh, of, of course, by really you know, aggressively expanding, spending a huge amount of money to do that so that people could train uh, you know, the, the algorithm and, and ultimately end up with a much more personalized feed that's harder to get mm -hmm. on a new service. Because when you start, you know, when you open up shorts or you open up mm -hmm. uh, reels, it hasn't been personalized for you yet until you start using until it. Start. So what do you look at as you've been on the edge of innovation most of the time, as he was joking about Facebook stealing stuff, but they do. They have taken a lot of your ideas. What do you think is really important in, this, in the area that you're strongest in, in communications? You, you've morphed different things. You've tried different things. What are you thinking about right now? You did a really cool thing at, at Con uh, on Vogue where you, you, you yourself put on a gown and you look lovely. Um, all these filters and things like that you did with Vogue. What are you looking at that is most exciting in creation and making things? Yeah. Uh, well, well, so much of communication is visual, which is why we've focused on augmented reality, right? Because mm -hmm. it empowers people right. to express themselves. And as we started doing that and people started building more lenses and we open sourced our, our mm -hmm. tools, Lens Studio, I shouldn't say open source, made available our tools uh, like Lens Studio so the creators could build more and more of these lenses. That's when we started to recognize the possibility of augmented reality beyond just self-expression. So what you mentioned is, is it, you know, trying on clothing is a huge area of investment for us because it's a way that augmented reality provides a huge amount of utility and differentiation. And possible monetization. To merchants and, and, and monetization mm -hmm. as well. Because what we find is when people can visualize themselves trying on uh, clothing, of course, they're you know, more likely to buy that clothing and they're mm -hmm. less likely to return it, especially if we can help them find uh, the, the right size. And so that's really a way that augmented reality today can make the shopping experience much better from the comfort uh, of your home without having to actually change your clothes. So a whole commerce business that you're thinking about, essentially. Not commerce on Snapchat per se, but powering commerce with augmented reality, you know, with all sorts of merchants. So we, we built out this uh, AR enterprise team that's, mm -hmm. a, you know, taking our AR shopping suite and helping merchants integrate uh, our AR technology into their own applications and websites to help. And then uh, what do you get, a part or a piece? Uh, well, t uh, today, you know, we're, we're no, just, yeah, t today we're just working on growing that business and getting feedback from our beta clients. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But over time, what we're planning on doing is, is more of an AR, you know, enterprise business model where, you know, there might be some small setup fee or something because it takes quite a lot of work to, to mm -hmm. get it integrated and up and running. And then if we're really driving conversions for you because, you know, more people are trying things mm -hmm. on and, and they like how they look and they want to buy, then we can take some small fee off of that transaction. Okay. Um, so I'm, uh, I want to do a compliment before a hard question. I'm, co <laughs> I'm coming back as you in my next life. Just, just FYI, I've decided that. Okay. Um, stock's down 75% this year. <laughs> um, but you're very handsome. Go ahead. <laughs> seriously, tall okay. drink of lemonade. Um, okay, all right, that's enough. Sorry. Okay. Uh, growth has slowed. And I follow, this is a boomer question. I've served on a, pub, a bunch of public company boards. I listened to your earnings call last night. You didn't say anything. What is your, how is your board not letting you speak on earnings calls? Why aren't you speaking? Isn't this exactly the time where CEOs should be speaking directly to investors? That, that was a huge mistake uh, that I shouldn't have made. Um, to be honest with you, I, I, I wasn't even thinking about it. I was obviously, I'm on the call. I'm waiting for a question. No one. Right asked a question addressed to me. So it wasn't me planned. More. You just felt like there were other people. I, I don't mean to put words in your yeah, mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, it wasn't planned. I was waiting. I actually kind of expected a question, kind of giving every, given everything going yeah. on. But you know, I'd also come in person in May to pre-announce that we were going to miss the bottom end of our yeah. guidance to a big investor conference, mm -hmm. answered a bunch of investor yeah. questions there in person. So like, I wasn't thinking, like, oh, I'm not engaged 
with investors because I spend quite a lot of time answering their questions and, and really helping them understand yep. our business. And we thought we were doing the right thing by being really transparent and coming out, you know, and saying, hey, we're going to come in below, you know, the, the low end of our guidance. And, you know, obviously plenty of other companies missed in that quarter too, but we thought it yep. was important to, to pre-announce. And so, so then when we were on the call, you know, generally on all these calls, uh, we, uh, you know, let folks answer the question. I don't, I'm not, I yep. don't think it was appropriate to step on top of yep. Derek or Jeremy or something like that to answer a question. Can I follow up with a question? Sure, go ahead. So, <laughs> you may. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Um, so you own 13% of the stock, but you have 51% of the voting stock, which means you control the company. Th that's the math I do. You control it. Um, it feels like everyone but Facebook and Google in this space are subscale. And unless they break out and start growing again, they should be acquired or they should partner with another company in terms of if they were really shareholder driven, at least that's my view. If at some point you didn't start scaling again uh, and someone like Comcast or Google approached you at this conference and said, we'll pay 100% premium for your stock today, do you, would you entertain selling the company? Before he answers, let's play something from 2018. Okay. <laughs> You Go regret ahead. not staying private then, smoothing out things <laughs> as you do this? I think this was the logical step forward uh, in being an independent company. So when we raised a lot of money from venture capitalists, right. you know, I guess our first investor invested at like a $4.25 million valuation. Right. right. The understanding from the venture capitalists was that we were going to provide an exit for them. And yeah. that was either going to be in the form of an acquisition or that would be in the form uh, of an IPO. Right. And so you did it for the venture capitalists? or? Because they don't care, and you shouldn't care about them, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, to, to be honest with you, like, we, do, we do care about them, and we do, we do care uh, uh, about our investors. And, right. and I think for us, this was a really great transition to take you know, what is ultimately short-term capital. Uh, venture investors are short-term investors. They right. invest for a couple of years, and then um, they rotate out their investments. And so we were able to transition inherently short-term investors to long-term investors. And, you know, despite you know, there being a little volatility that comes with that, ultimately that's the right thing to do to build our right. business. By the way, I did not know that video was going to happen. See, there you go. There, you well done. That's right, because yeah. I'm the brains of the operation. Um, <laughs> so, what, what, answer his question. Um, well, gosh, so, so as you point out, you know, Bobby and I own 20 something percent of the business. We're very focused on its long term success because we want to see. But you control, see... just to be clear, you own 99 percent. You control the. You make all the decisions. Right here is the company. You own 51% of the voting shares. You make every decision at the end of the day. Everyone else is just an advisor. They're all influencers. You're the decision maker. At some point, would you personally be open to selling the company if it was fairly apparent it was the best thing for shareholders? Well, personally, from where I sit today, when I look at the long-term opportunity yep. in our business, I really believe it's enormous. I believe we're far from reaching our full potential, and I believe over time, you know, the stock price has gone up and down, and we've tried to stay focused on delivering, you know, real value for shareholders. You know, since our IPO, we've, you know, I think grown revenue 10x or something, last 12 months revenue 10x. Mm -hmm. It's about, you know, 50 plus percent year over year on, on average for the last five years. We've doubled the size of our community. We believe those things are really important for building long-term value yep. uh, for, for shareholders. I mean, of course, a, a, along the way, we've really tried to continue to innovate, to increase uh, you know, our, our long-term opportunity with things like our map, for example, our augmented reality platform. These are big innovations and, and big investments that we think really contribute to the long-term value of our business as we monetize those parts of our service over time. And so if you look at the, you know, the engagement in, you know, across Snapchat, 350 million daily active users growing really rapidly, and the level uh, of monetization of our service, right, on a just average revenue per user basis, I think it's something's, you know, still today, like half of Twitter's, mm -hmm. right? Uh, certainly a small fraction uh, of Facebook's. And so when we look at our overall opportunity, we look at the engagement just on the core Snapchat platform today, we believe we have an enormous amount of opportunity ahead of us. So we've really got to focus on executing. It's going to be difficult because you're right, we are smaller than these other very, very large 
companies. But these other very large companies started as small companies too. They were asked many of the same questions about mm -hmm. competition. They were asked many of the same questions uh, you know, about revenue growth. They faced a lot of volatility and many challenges themselves. That's, that's the difficulty of building an independent business. But I think so far, Bobby and I believe that the best way to realize our long-term mm -hmm. potential is by building a, an independent company. And I think, you know, while the stock price has gone up and down over time, we have slowly and steadily increased the long-term value of our business. So let's talk about small companies. We have a lot of talk about tech regulation here. Um, You've said in the past you would support thoughtful regulation. How do you look at the, uh, most of the people who have been on stage here do not support Amy Klobuchar's antitrust bill. There's lots of bills out there. There's some in Europe, everywhere else. How are you looking at the regulatory landscape as a smaller company compared to these larger? You wouldn't be subject to many of these things. Um, how do you look at that? Well, there are so many pieces of, of proposed legislation mm -hmm. flying around all, all mm -hmm. over the world uh, right now that I think it's really hard to engage sort of piece by piece, right? Mm -hmm. So I think for us, it's much more important to sort of look at like the, the big ideas that might influence the way that tech evolves in the future. And more importantly, to build a strategy that does not rely on government intervention for our success, right? right? I, I think historically, these processes have taken a long time. The outcomes have been quite mixed, mm -hmm. and what's been really important for small businesses is not to wait for the, the government to, to come, come to the rescue, right. but actually just to continue executing mm -hmm. on you know the, our, our strategy, to focus on our community, which is so important to the long-term growth of our mm -hmm. business, mm -hmm. and just to continue to delight them uh, with great products. So while we, we're keeping an, an eye on that, I think there's just too much uh, well, to track. Well, the antitrust bill, would that help you if it passes? It's, it's, again, it's, it's so hard to know because in it, its current form, I'm sure it would change a lot before mm -hmm. it ever you know, was considered uh, mm -hmm. to, to pass. So I, I don't know, and it's hard to respond to, and we could spend so much time chasing all this legislation around, mm -hmm. but that would take us further away from our customer Focusing and really delivering thing. value for so, them. So right now, what companies do you view as your core competition at this moment? I think today as it pertains to performance advertising, direct response advertising, mm -hmm. which is a big focus mm -hmm. of ours, it's, you know, Meta continues to be a, a very, very large uh, and challenging competitor. Mm -hmm. Meta continues to be. How do you look at what's going on? And they've made a big bet on the metaverse. How are you looking at that? You talk about AR, but not Meta. Well, we, we like to talk really specifically in terms of the value that we provide our community, mm -hmm. which is why AR is, is so important to our strategy, because mm -hmm. they know what it is, they use it every day, and, and they love it because it brings value to their lives, mm -hmm. right? It helps them express themselves or learn about things in new ways or even solve a math problem. I mean, you can point your Snapchat camera at a really complex uh, you know, quadratic equation, and, and you know, our camera will help you solve it. And so I think AR is really real in the lives of our community because of the utility that it provides. And so we try to talk really specifically about that mm -hmm. and, and show our community uh, you know, our innovation rather than sort of talking about some future Do you verse. have any investments in doing metaverse stuff, or are you just like, whatever, Mark? We're, we've been trying to figure out what it means. Uh, it seems to mean virtual reality, you know, putting on a headset and sort of escaping the real world and going somewhere else. And that, that's going in a totally different direction than our strategy, which is about integrating computing into the real world. Mm -hmm. We believe that that's the healthiest way to use computing. It's the most familiar because you can rely on, you know, all of these interactions that you're used to, uh, of course, um, from just navigating the, the physical world. And so our, our focus in our business is we believe most people are going to spend most of the time in the real world. And mm -hmm. how can we augment that and make that better mm -hmm. through computing? And that's really different than this idea of virtual reality, which is about escaping the world. Mm -hmm. Scott, last question. And so we'll you, you're a, well, by most standards, by tech standards, you're a young dad. You're 34, is that right? 32, yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, you have uh, two young kids and an 11-year-old. And do you have any, I mean, you're facing, you have a tremendous amount of, of business pressure and you're under a lot of spotlight and a lot of scrutiny as a public company CEO and you have three kids. Do you have any advice for young fathers in terms of trying to balance the, the push and the pull of having that kind of scrutiny and that kind of pressure and also trying to manage a household with three kids and be a good partner? Uh... Gosh. I knew he was going to ask a man question, but go ahead. Uh, uh, I mean, it's just so, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, 
<laughs> she, uh, so so I, I struggle with it every day. I mean, I, you know, just before going on stage, I'm thinking about, you know, I'm hosting a dinner after this. I'm thinking about, do I have 30 minutes in between the time I get off stage? You know, 15 minutes to drive home, 15 minutes to read to Hart, who's our four, you know, four and a half year old, uh, before I have to go to, to this dinner so that I can have that, you know, precious time together. It's, it's all consuming. I think this is, as parents, what all of us struggle with all the time. And Miranda's actually out of town for these couple of days, which is, not ideal timing. So, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's difficult. It's, it's always difficult. I, I haven't found a you know, magic solution or answer because I also feel an enormous responsibility to you know, our business, to our team, to our community, you know, hundreds of millions of people that use our product. And so I feel pulled in a, you know, a million directions all the time. So I, I wish it were easy. I think it's hard. I think it's hard for all, all dads to, to make those uh, trade-offs, and it was much harder before the pandemic because I, I really rarely saw our kids. I'd get up and go to the office before they were awake. I'd get home, you know, obviously before or you know after they had fallen asleep. I was traveling, let's call it half the weekends, and it was eating at me. And the last couple of years profoundly changed my life because I got to be home with them during such a formative part of their lives. You know, now the two youngest are both off to preschool uh, this year, and you know, so, so I just feel so grateful to have had this little moment in time to be with our family like that because I, you know, I know that that's not what it's gonna be like going forward. All right, questions, all right. So, yeah. <laughs> you weren't expecting a dad question, were you? Okay, right here. Hi. Uh, we only got five minutes because we're bringing on our final <laughs> panel. Okay, uh, until today, I just searched you up on Google and you're 32, that's kind of crazy. All <laughs> right, so that means you, I was one of the first Snapchat users probably back in like, 2010, 2011, awesome. something like that. And I didn't know you were 22 or 21 at the time. So what was your biggest challenge finding partnerships for your startup? Uh, that's a great um, question. Um, so, so in terms of finding partnerships, I, I think the bigger challenge for us early on, uh, you know, as the, as the service started um, growing, was that most people hadn't used it. Um, many people, if they knew about it, knew about it through their kids. And so actually what we found very quickly is, you know, we, we talked with partners or spoke with investors. We could really quickly filter, you know, partners and investors by whether or not their kids had used Snapchat. And, you know, if partners had kids that used Snapchat and investors had kids that used Snapchat, they totally got it right away and were ready to have a, a really interesting conversation. And they saw the role that it played, you know, in the lives of their kids and for, and for investors and partners that didn't, it was so hard to overcome, you know, the misperceptions, the confusion about, uh, you know, Snapchat that, you know, at that point, we, we just kind of flipped the conversation, tried to figure out how much can we learn from them because we know that it's really going to be difficult to get any investment or, or partnership. So I think it was really just about, you know, the level of understanding of, of our partners or investors. The product itself. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Evan, Alex at The Verge. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, so the only thing you and Mark Zuckerberg agree on, I think, is that AR glasses are going to be big one day. The problem is, is that they're investing a lot, way more than you can. Apple is going to come into it as well. And so this conversation has revolved around companies being able to invest more at scale and how that impacts companies like yours. Um, you implied in your annual letter yesterday to employees that the next version of Spectacles will be dev only as well, so it's going to take a while for it to hit consumer scale. Um, how do you do hardware in that environment when you've got these massive companies that also think what you think about AR glasses? Do you want to license Snap OS, the software in the glasses, to another company? Is that how you survive if that transition to wearables really happens like you think it will? A lot in there. Um, Okay, so, so, so first and foremost, I think like one of the things that's so exciting about the technology industry over time is that capital is not always a predictor of success. That's, sure. that's I think, one of the things that draws so many people to this industry and excites so many people about this industry because true innovation, especially long-term, complex, technical innovation, can create really breakout uh, products, even when your competitors have way more money and are spending a lot more and hiring more people. Because in fact, I think what happens uh, is that many of those companies that are spending a lot more money aren't having to make hard choices. 
And design is all about those hard choices and trade-offs. And when you have lots of money and someone presents you with three options, you know, you say, let's do all three, right? And, and that means that ultimately, over time, you miss the opportunity to learn and to iterate and evolve the product as quickly as you could if you were really constrained by, you know, the, the amount you could invest. And so we're not constrained the way that we were a few years ago when we started investing in spectacles. I think we started working on our glasses products seven or eight years ago now. We took a very measured and step-by-step -step approach, you know, first integrating one camera, then two cameras, then really understanding, you know, how 3D could play a role with content. Then, of course, releasing glasses that have a display now. And, and we've learned along the way, making those tough design trade-offs so much about what people want from AR glasses. And so to your point, we, we have along the way also developed really amazing software. And now that people are understanding how difficult it is to build you know, AR, an AR platform, not only in terms of you know, the Snap OS, but also in terms of the developer platform with Lens Studio, the, the engine itself that runs uh, lenses, you, you're right. People are asking us, hey, can, can you help out with your software? We're, you know, we're working on our glasses too. So I, I think that might be an option for us in the future, but, but when we started, nobody was working on glasses for consumers. That's why we had to start working on it ourselves, because we believed that breaking AR out of the conf confines of this phone, right, with this tiny touchscreen, was going to totally transform the experience for our community, because it's immersive. You can walk around. You can engage, you know, with your hands in a totally different way, and, and that's why we started building it. So, I, I, obviously, I, I can't predict, you know, what the future will hold, but what gives me a, a lot of hope um, is that, you know, historically in our industry, spending huge amounts yes. of money is not always correlated with, with long-term success. Yeah, you should be hardware's... speaking on earnings calls, trust me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, one more very quick question right here, and that's all we have. we got to get to the last panel. Go Thanks. ahead, very Hi. quick. Hi, uh, Clara Chan with The Hollywood Reporter. Um, you announced some pretty major restructuring last week, part of the layoffs, and one of the parts I was interested in was the departure of Snap Originals. And I'm curious, why did Snap not find success with original content? I mean, YouTube's also moving away from it. Are we going to see other platforms that primarily have user-generated content essentially get scared off from, from attempting original content? Yeah, so, so as we looked at you know, restructuring our business, one of the primary things we were focused on was <laughs> focus. We really wanted to help the team you know, rally around our core priorities because we really believe that that focus is what's going to drive the results that we're looking for. And so while we've actually had a, a lot of success with originals, and many of the originals we've created have reached a really you know, large audience, of course helped us drive revenue, what we found was that making original content is not one of our core strengths. We're much more focused on you know, technical innovation around our core platform, and that's really what our team needs to focus on right now. So it's, it's one of those heartbreaking instances where you're faced with really, really tough trade-offs and, and, and choices. And in this case, we said, you know, look, let's, let's focus on you know, what our core strengths are because we can't do everything in this really volatile and uncertain macroeconomic environment. And our partners are incredibly good at making content. I mean, I think, I think this year we're on track to pay out more than half a billion dollars to our content partners and creators who make amazing content on Snapchat. And so with all these amazing partners that we're working with who have found a sustainable business model, you know, releasing their content uh, on Snapchat, we're going to focus on that strategy. And, and then, of course, you know, really evolve the platform rather than uh, you know, working on something that's outside of, of really our core strengths, even though it's, it's been a really important piece of our business historically. OK. Evan, you really do should speak on earnings calls. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. <laughs>